Well hello, it's uh, Andrew again and today we're at episode 53 and uh, we're continuing through Matthew's Gospel uh, we've got one of the littlest parables today Matthew chapter 13 verse 44 The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid then in his joy he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. This is one of three short parables that reveal how the kingdom is discovered and how it might be responded to. To the 21st century mind this is a peculiar kind of thing really. If the treasure, or treasure was what was important, why buy the field? Surely finders keepers would apply. After all, who would know? Actually, here's the first problem. The person who found it would know. And if they just took it and quietly disappeared, just their little secret, all the rest of their lives they may well have felt like a thief. When I was 14 years old I worked for my father after school. He had a um, a number of um, soft drink machines in various factories in downtown Dunedin and uh, I would go after school and I would service them. I would um, take crates of fresh bottles up and uh, fill the machines and uh, take out the empties and uh, empty the cash box into a, a bag which Dad had provided me. And then I would head home and I remember one particular year, it was, I was in the fourth form, it was cold, it was miserable, it was a grey, damp, ugh, Dunedin winter. And I came out a couple of times uh, after uh, having done my duties and I was just cold and hungry. It was getting dark and uh, so what I did was I took a little bit of money out of the, uh, out of the bag and um, bought myself a scoop of chips. I did this probably a couple of times and uh, went home warmed and uh, with a slightly fuller stomach as I caught the bus home to, to where we were living. Here's the thing, that was with me for decades. For decades. It was a good three decades later that um, I wrote to Dad he wasn't living too far away, but I wrote to Dad and sent him a letter and I calculated how much money I'd taken, because I was actually paid to do the job. I calculated how much money I'd taken out of his bag and um, compounded it with interest over the uh, intervening 30 plus years and uh, included a check, I think, for, for about $45 and uh, wrote the letter to Dad and sent it to him. Um, he cashed the check, <laughs> which was which was good. But I was okay after that. You know, it wasn't one of those things that continued to weigh upon me. <clears throat> it might sound small, and in some ways it is, but it's the little things that actually matter. And so just keeping it is not, I would want to suggest, a kingdom option. We need to recognise, though, that these are different times from the times that Jesus is talking about. They didn't have banks like we know them now. And military invasions was always a possibility. The military would move across and move across. <clears throat> and the safest place for your treasure was often simply to bury it in the ground. So as long as you remembered or mapped out where the treasure was buried, the safest place for the treasure um, was in the ground and, and as long as you left guidance for the inheritors of your estate they too would know where to collect it when the time came. So we see in the parable of the talents for example that the timid servant who was given only one talent he took the safest option. You know it's easy to criticize him, he should have put it with the money lenders but he took the absolute safest option. He did what time-honoured uh, practice was. He buried it in the ground. He knew where it was safe. 
One wonders whether the finder in the story reburied the treasure in the same place. That was the thought that occurred to me. Maybe he buried it somewhere else. Is it possible, though, that the owner of the field knew all along where the treasure was buried? Because he might have buried it himself and would be careful to remove it before releasing the field to its new owner. So that if he was selling it, he'd think, okay, yeah, I'll sell it, but before I actually complete the transaction, I'll go and dig up my treasure. And if this was the case, if he did know, imagine his dismay when he cannot find the treasure where he buried it. He would then surely suspect that the new owner was the one who may well have taken it. I want to suggest that the treasure was put back exactly where it was found. So he makes an offer for the property. There's a risk that the treasure will be removed by the owner before the property is transferred. There is no doubt that that risk exists. Still, he'll still have the field. And presumably he will have bought it at a fair price. It would indicate, though, that the treasure, that the owner, the previous owner, had known all the time about the treasure. He's paid for it all he has. It may be, though, that the treasure is part of the field itself. Maybe it has a particular view, just the perfect spot on which to build a new house. Maybe it's especially fertile and that the serendipitous finder discovers a rare and valuable plant that he has never seen grow anywhere else in this region. And he thinks, I'm on a winner here if I buy this field. Clearly though, in the mind of the new owner, the field and the treasure come as a single package. He or she is clear that they belong together and he doesn't get one without the other. There is, a, to me, a sense of providence involved in this story. The finder just happens upon the treasure. This is where God is often at work in unseen ways. We see it in the Old Testament love story of Ruth the Moabites, where in the Hebrew, she happens to happen upon the field of Boaz. Pure chance? Nah. And so we see here the finder, I would suggest, is directed at some way that never understands. I've, I've been in those situations where I've come across things that I would never have found if I was looking for them. Or where my mind would have said I needed to look for them. Anyway, that's another story. For the finder, this is both an opportunity and a character test. The finder is not presumably out specifically looking for treasure. He's crossing the field, and he stumbles across it. It may have been literally the case. There may have been a wooden peg that had been driven into the ground to mark the spot, and he happens to step on it. His curiosity is aroused, and he digs to find out what's there. As with much of life, opportunities just seem to come across our path. How we respond to them determines what happens next. Moses happens to observe a bush that is burning. His curiosity gets the better of him, and he goes to investigate and realises that the bush is not being consumed. This leads for Moses to a significant God moment. I believe that we are providentially being offered opportunities all the time. We just don't notice. And so, 
for the, the, the treasure finder. This one stumbles across the treasure. The character test is, what will he do next? Will he just take it? Will he alert the owner that it exists? In fact, he chooses a middle path. It's actually a path of wisdom. Recognising that the owner may be totally unaware of its existence. So he offers to buy the field. Presumably, as I said before, he pays a fair price. It costs him, we read, all that he had. He had nothing left. But in the end, he still had the field. Upon completing the transaction, he returns to see if the treasure is still there. It is. And it's now his. The previous owner, unaware of the treasure he had, and being willing to part with it, demonstrate he had demonstrated he had no more right to claim it after the sale than the purchaser did before the sale. Makes sense to you? Makes sense to me. The call of the kingdom is a call to respond to the opportunities that God puts in front of us. It's also a call to integrity. The little things matter. The field and the treasure go together. The treasure is the gift. The field is now his responsibility to care for it, to husband it responsibly. And who knows, as he does this, as he gives it the due care and attention it deserves, he may yet find more buried treasure. God bless you.